And here we are. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good day to you, wherever you may happen to be. I'm Tad, I'm here in Northern California, not very far from the beach, uh, about three miles from the beach, which is just far enough away to be in the hills. Um, we're tree people more than beach people. Um, I, uh, I've never really been much of a beach person. I grew up in Northern California where the beach culture is not, although the surfing culture is very strong, uh, the beach culture is a little less so than in say Southern California. My, my ex-wife, my first marriage, she grew up in Southern California and told me that, uh, when she was a teenager that, um, she and her sister used to go out to the beach. Um, first sunny day of the spring and lie out all day so that they got sunburned all over. And then when that peeled off, that was their base coat <laughs> for the, the year's tan. And that story just horrified me so much. It stuck with me ever since, even though I was first told it some 35 years ago or so. Um, not part of my California culture, I hasten to say, uh, and as I've pointed out many times, I'm a very pale person. I'm a pale, kind of a pinkish person. Um, not meant for beaches, um, not, uh, not missing that part of life all that much. In fact, I, I, it's a great source of frustration to anybody who's ever lived with me or hung out with me who likes going to the beach because I can be out there for about 10 or 15 minutes and then I'm like, I don't feel very good. <laughs> I have to go in the shade somewhere. Anyway, I don't know what I'm babbling about. I'm just babbling as usual. Um, so good to see you. Nice of you to join me. Uh, those of you who have joined me, those of you who are out there and are trickling in, trickling in, trickling in. Um, we will be reading um, more. We're actually getting quite far into. We've got most of, we've read most of, as you can see, most of the first other land book. I think when I finish um, with this volume, I'm going to take a short break um, for a week or so and sort of figure out what's going on next instead of just starting a new book. Um, not that I don't like sharing time with you guys. I enjoy that very much. I just like to find another way to do it other than just reading um, and just babbling, <laughs> which is another thing I can always do, but I'm not sure it's necessarily a, a viable long-term plan. Um, anyway, what else? What did I want to talk about? There's not a lot happening here at uh, the Beale Williams Honor Rancho. Um, we've had odd spotty weather all week, so we've been kind of making our adjustments to that. It rains, the dogs track muddy paw prints in and out, we clean that up. Um, you know, then it's dry and normal for a few days, and then it rains again, and it's muddy footprints time. Um, we're working, we're doing things. I'm working on Navigator's Children now, pretty much to the exclusion of anything else. Um, as I mentioned, great deal of juggling going on as I am interleaving new bits, moving old bits around, uh, adding on, you know, and going to finish it, basically, because um, I never finished it when I was still in first draft stage before I had to start doing other things like prepping the first half of it for publication. So that's what I'm mostly doing and failing at everything else because I'm going through a bout of, uh, I don't know what you call it, soft tissue stuff, inflammatory stuff, which makes it very difficult to do almost anything, including even just holding a phone to read or a book. So uh, I can type, but for very short stretches. So, you know, not to complain not to complain, but that's just, uh, it, it, anybody who's writing me, you know, emails or sending me, you know, messages on Facebook or Twittering me or whatever, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm even worse at replying than I usually am just because it, it, it hurts. <laughs> so I'm not doing as much of it as I normally would and I'm falling. I was already far behind. I was already years behind on all the things people have sent to me. Don't have an assistant. I mean, 
obviously Deborah does a huge amount for our business, um, but she does so much that she does not have time to answer my mail, and I don't have time to answer my mail these days anyway, even before I um, started having problems with, with uh, the, the joints and stuff. But that's enough misering and miserating and whining about uh, infl inflammation issues. What else of interest is there? It's been a pretty boring week, and that's okay with me, believe me, honestly. Um, you know, the world is full of enough crises that I'm happy to have a week without any domestic crises. Um, just the usual. So, let me say hello to the folks who have checked in and see how everybody's doing there. What is that? And what? Yes, hello. There's an Easter, complicated Easter thing from Holger, but I don't know how that wound up on the screen. Hide message from the stream. Oh, okay, I see. All right. I don't know what I clicked to make that happen, but it happened anyway. Didn't I hope that was something you wanted to share, Holger. Um, okay, so let me see who's here. Ronnie's here. Ronnie says, hello. Good morning from beautiful Prague. Oh, I was just in Prague a couple of years ago, and it is indeed beautiful. There's very little doubt about that. It's a lovely, lovely city, and I had a very nice time there. Kristen, hello, good to see you. Holger says, happy Easter and a good Sunday to all from sunny Val de I'm glad to hear it. Um, so Easter, can someone fill the knowledge gap for me between nailing the son of, the God, of God to the cross to a rabbit? Um, <laughs> yes, it, it's, no, it's not. It's, you can mention Harry Dresden. Um, that's quite all right. There is no blasphemy in the tad, Tadiverse. Um, rather the contrary, which is that I welcome all stripes of discussions and opinions and even the names of other writers. That's all right. So yes, the Dresden books, Jim Butcher, absolutely no problem. Um, yeah, bunnies, eggs, eggs and bunnies, rebirth, spring. That's basically the whole Easter thing, rebirth and spring. Uh, Mark, hello. Good morning, Mark. Good to see you. That's Mark Redman, of course. Checking in from Yorkshire. Iris, hello, good morning, and happy Easter to you too. Catherine, hello, nice to see you. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Andre, hello, hello, good to see you too. Wouter, hello, good evening, good morning, happy Easter. Um, time for our breakfast with lots of eggs and Easter stollen, as I'm guessing some of the Germans present also enjoy. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Um, Holger is replying to somebody. Chris popping in to say hello and leaving as quickly as he has, he has to. Um, <laughs> I, I hope that's not because somebody's chasing you. And if so, you really didn't need to pop in and say hello. You know, if you're currently like going through some kind of born ultimatum thing where mysterious deadly murderers are trying to kill you and you don't know why. But I'm pleased that you did pop in to say hello anyway. Uh, let's see, who else have we got here? Bum, bum, bum. It's all Vouter and Holger talking to different people. Debbie. Hello, Debbie. Good morning. That's either Bode or Bode or Boda, depending on where Debbie is checking in from. So feel free to let me know. I always like to know how to pronounce people's names correctly. So Debbie, if you want to let me know how the last name is pronounced, because I've seen that name and I've heard it pronounced different ways. That last name, anyway. Debbie, obviously, I'm assuming is pronounce the way it sounds. Um, 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 let's see who we got. Tim. Hello, Tim. Good. Nice to have you. Jeremy went out and celebrated Passover with friends. Excellent. And Cliff was there. Well, if Cliff is asleep, that's okay with me. I completely understand that Cliff might want to be asleep at this time since Cliff is a family man and has a big family. Um, so we all have to uh, take our rest when we can get it. And let me see. All right. I think that's mostly everybody that I've checked in with. And uh, as several people have mentioned, it is Easter. It's always an odd thing. I was just actually emailing with a friend of ours in England who we're going to be talking to on the phone tomorrow or Skyping with tomorrow. And she was saying that, you know, Easter has fully kicked in. It's a four day weekend in England. And having lived in England, I can tell you that the holidays, Christmas, 
Easter, but Christmas particularly, are very different than they are in America. In America, traditionally, everything is open pretty much every day. And if somebody closes their business, even on Christmas Day, you're kind of like, well, what's that about? I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, like businesses, offices, you know, but I'm talking about retail businesses, stores, things like that. You know, everybody kind of expects at most things to be open on Christmas in America. Um, and the uh, the difference in England was quite striking when I first got there. And at the time I got to England, basically it's like the tube didn't run at night and all kinds of things. And, you know, you'd walk down the streets in, in you know, the middle of town because we lived in North London. We weren't that far from the center of London. And everything was closed and hardly anybody was on the streets and all the people who were there looked like they were... Um, you know, hurrying home to, to you know, to, to get out of the cold or whatever. Um, it's very Dickensian. But, you know, really, they took Christmas super, super seriously. And, and you know, businesses would literally be closed for a week or two and things like that. And um, it wasn't very far, you know, when I lived there, it wasn't very far from the time when, you know, everything was closed for like two weeks from Christmas through New Year's. Um, and, this friend of ours was just commenting to me in an email about how uh, how interesting it was to be back to that and and away from the American thing of kind of like, yeah, 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 we're having a holiday. Um, brr, okay, it lasts about another two hours. Okay, it's over. You know, where there's, you know, they're, they're really all in on the holidays in the UK. And as I said, Easter's about four hours long. Anyway, so... I, it was kind of nice, though. I did kind of appreciate that. It was it was interesting for somebody like me who's always willing to go to ground, who is basically badger like by. Ah, there must be I'm, there's a term for that. I should know. You know, there's like canine, feline, caprine, which means goats, um, lapine, rabbits. There's got to be a term for badgers, but off the top of my head, I can't think of what it is. Um, but I am very badger-like in that sense. It just give me my hole. I will go down into it and be quite happy down there. So, all right. Have I dealt with everything that had to be dealt with? So anyway, yeah. So happy Easter to all of those who celebrate. As you may know, um, I come from a very non-religious family. Um, I'm sure I've told everybody in the world the story about our son, <laughs> Uh, Connor, who who I, I know I've if people have been to my readings, you've probably heard this story before, but I always thought it was very telling about how both my family and then the family that I've raised with Deborah, who was also raised fairly non-religiously, um, we were coming driving through San Francisco after having been to the zoo when Connor was maybe five years old or so, and his sister was about two or something like that. And as we're driving along this long stretch of road in San Francisco, going slowly upward, because of course San Francisco is all hills and ups and downs. And Connor got very excited. He's going, Dad, Dad, look at that building. Look at that building up there. And he's pointing at this church, um, you know, kind of a modernist church up at the top of this hill as we're driving slowly toward it in traffic. And I went, yeah, it's a nice building. He goes, but look, look, isn't that great? And I'm like, I couldn't figure out what he was so excited about. I said, yeah, it's a really nice building, hon. What, what is it that's got you so excited? He goes, well, they must really like mathematics because they've got a plus sign on the top. <laughs> I, at that point, I realized we'd probably undereducated our children on comparative religions if he didn't recognize the Christian cross. So uh, on the way home, I told him the whole thing about, you know, well, here, honey, here's what, you know, people who are Christians believe this and other people believe that. And Connor listened to this all very patiently and said, well, yeah, okay, I hear you. And it's really interesting to know, but I still like Thor, God of Thunder, best of all, because he can fight the Hulk. Couldn't argue. Anyway, all right. So after having said all of that, um, I am now going to start reading again from Otherland. We are on chapter 32. What happened last week, for those of you who missed the ending, was that Rini and Kabu, as they were in their V-tanks, with the help of Jeremiah and less help from Rini's father, Long Joseph, 
being gotten into other lands supposedly by Singh, the hacker, and accompanied by Martine, the semi-mysterious researcher, something happened, something very bad and very strange happened, and they sort of lost control of the whole operation, and Rini felt something that felt to her undeniably like Singh, the hacker, dying as he was trying to get them into this, and they found themselves in the grip of something inhuman and incomprehensible. And that was the end of that last chapter. Um, no, she realized, a last flicker of reason in her dying mind, I'm being swallowed. That was the last of that chapter. So, chapter 32, The Dance. Netfeed, Linear Doc, I-E-N, Hour 23, Europe, North America, Death Parade. Visual, slow motion of man being kicked and beaten by mob. Voiceover. Sepp Oswald hosts a roundup of deaths, including a lynch mob beating, caught on surveillance cameras, a rape murder recorded by the murderer and later used as evidence against him, and a live telecast from a beheading in the Red Sea Free State. Winner of Name the Reaper mascot, to be announced. So, you're having trouble breathing, are you? The smiling, yellow-haired man pushed something made of cold metal into Orlando's mouth. It clicked against the back of his throat, like someone had snapped him there with a weak rubber band. Hmm, well, maybe I'd better have a listen, too. He placed a membranous probe against Orlando's chest, then watched the spikes on the wall screen. That doesn't sound good, I'm afraid. Orlando had to hand it to the bastard. He'd never seen Orlando before, but he'd barely reacted at all. Not even that funny look in the eyes Orlando had become used to seeing when people were working hard at treating him normally. The yellow-haired man straightened up and turned to Vivian. It's... Definitely pneumonia. We'll put him on some of the new contrabiotics, but with his special circumstances, well, I'd recommend you bring him in for a stay at our infirmary. No. Orlando shook his head emphatically. He hated the Crown Heights infirmary and didn't like the smooth-talking rich people's doctor either. He could also tell that the slick young medicine man wasn't very comfortable with the special circumstances, the unignorable fact of Orlando's long-term condition. But much as he would have liked to, Orlando couldn't really hold that against him. Nobody else was comfortable with it either. We'll talk about it, Orlando. His mother's tone unmistakably told him not to embarrass her by being a stubborn little bastard in front of this nice young man. Thank you, Dr. Donuts. The doctor smiled and bobbed his head, then sauntered out of the examining room. Watching him go, Orlando wondered if he'd gone to some special creepy suck-up-to-rich-patients school. If Dr. Donuts thinks you belong in the infirmary, Vivian began, but Orlando interrupted. What are they going to do? It's pneumonia. They're going to give me contra -bees just like the other times. What difference does it make where I am? Besides, I hate that place. It looks like they had some horrible person come in and decorate it so that the so the rich jerkies who come here would feel like when they get sick, it's not like normal people getting sick. A smile tugged at the corner of Vivian's mouth, but she did her best to suppress it. Um, no one's saying you're supposed to like it, but this is your health we're talking about. No, it's whether I'm going to die from pneumonia this time or from something else next week or next month. The brutality of it silenced her. He slid off the examining table and began pulling his shirt on. Even that effort made him feel weak and short of breath. He looked away, determined to hide how miserable he felt. Otherwise, the whole thing would be too much like a bad flick. When he turned, she was crying. Don't, don't talk like that, Orlando. He put his arm around her, but at the same time, he was angry. Why should he be comforting her? 
Who is living under the death sentence anyway? Just get me the drugs. The nice pharmacy woman will give them to us and we'll add them onto my pile. Please, Vivian, let's just go home. They say that making the patient feel comfortable is important. I won't be better off in that stupid infirmary. Vivian wiped her eyes. We'll talk to your father about it. Orlando levered himself back into the wheelchair. He did feel pretty impacted, feverish and slow, bubbling a little at every breath, and he knew he didn't have the strength right now even to walk back across the Crown Heights Medical Center to the car, let alone to their house half a mile away across the complex. But he was damned if he was going to get stuck in their damned infirmary. For one thing, they might try to keep him off the net. Nurses and doctors got some idiot ideas sometimes, and now of all times he couldn't afford that risk. He'd had pneumonia twice before and survived, although it had never been fun. Still, as Vivian pushed him down the corridor toward the pharmaceutical department, the Patch Ranch, as Orlando called it, he couldn't help wondering whether this might not really be it. Perhaps he had already walked somewhere on his own for the last time. That was a horrible thought. There ought to be some way to tell when you were doing something for the last time, so you could appreciate it. An announcement crawling along the bottom of your vision, like when you had the news ticker running on the net. 14-year-old Orlando Gardner of San Mateo, California, has just eaten ice cream for the last time in his life. His last laugh is expected sometime next week. What are you thinking about, Orlando? His mother asked. He shook his head. The city stood before him, golden, thrilling, impossibly tall towers, shimmering with their own inner light. The only thing he truly wanted waited for him within that thicket of brilliance. He took a step toward it, then another, but the gleaming spires wobbled and disappeared. Cold, wet darkness was suddenly all around him. A reflection. He had lunged at a reflection in the water, and now he was drowning, choking, filling up with black fluids. He sat up, his breath rattling in his lungs. His head felt like a hot balloon. Boss, Bezel whirred in the corner, detaching himself from the power outlet. Orlando waved his hand, struggling to get air past the phlegm. He thumped himself on the chest, then coughed. He bent over, feeling the blood rush into his throbbing skull and spat into the medical wastebasket. I'm okay, he wheezed when he got his breath back. Don't want to talk. He pawed his tea jack off the bedside table and clicked it into the Nero cannula. Are you sure you're okay? I could wake up your parents. Don't you dare. I just had a dream. Beazle, who had very little in his programming about dreams, other than the ability to access literary and scientific references, did not reply to this. You had a couple of calls. Do you want to hear the messages? Orlando squinted at the time, superimposed on the upper right of his field of vision, and glowing blue against the shadowy drapes beyond. It's almost four in the morning. Who called? Fredericks. Both times. She's seen. Okay, return the call. Frederick's broad-faced Sim appeared in the window, yawning, but still somehow looking nervous. Geez, Gardino, I figured I wasn't going to hear back from you tonight. Well, what is it? You aren't going to back out on me, are you? Frederick's hesitated. Orlando felt a stony weight in his stomach. I... I was just talking to some people at school yesterday, and this guy they know he got arrested for breaking into some local government system. It was a, a prank, basically, just tap and nap. But they threw him out of his academy and gave him three months in one of those juvenile re-edge holes. 
So? Orlando turned down the gain on his voice line so he could cough up more phlegm. He didn't feel up to this. He didn't have the strength to keep pushing ahead by himself. Didn't Frederick see this? So, so the government and the big carriers are really cracking down right now. I mean, it's a bad time to be messing around with other people's systems, Orlando. I don't want to... See, my parents would... Fredericks trailed off, ox-like face showing a sort of blank concern. For a moment, Orlando hated him or her. And when would be a good time? Let me guess. Never? What is this, Orlando? I asked you before, why is this city or whatever you saw so damned important? I mean, you signed up to go work for some gear house for years just so you could try to get a little closer to this thing. Orlando laughed sourly. Indigo Gear had as much chance of getting blood from a billiard ball as years out of him. Then the anger suddenly evaporated, leaving behind only a vacuum-like emptiness. Here, in this dark room with his parents only yards away and his friend on the other end of the line, he suddenly felt completely and utterly alone. I can't explain, he said quietly. Not really. Frederick stared. Try. I... He took a breath, grunted. When it came down to it, there was no way to explain, not really. I have dreams. I dream about that city all the time. And, and in the dreams, I know there's something there, something important that I have to find. He took another pinched breath. Have to? But why? And even if you... If you do really have to find this place, what's the hurry? We just got thrown out of that treehouse network. Shouldn't we wait for a little while? I can't wait. After he said it, he knew that if Frederick a Fredericks asked, he would explain everything. The words hung in the air as though he could see them, as though they glowed in the night shadows like the clock numerals can't wait? Frederick said it slowly, sensing something. I'm... I'm not going to live very long. It was like taking off your clothes in public. Frightening, but then a kind of chilly freedom. I'm dying, basically. The silence stretched so long that if Orlando had not been able to see his friend's sim, he would have thought that Fredericks had clicked off. Oh, come on, say something. Orlando, I, I'm... Oh my God, really? Really. It's not a big deal. I, I mean, I've known about it for a long time. I was born with... Well, it's this genetic thing called progeria. You might have heard about it, seen a documentary. Frederick said nothing. Orlando had trouble getting his breath. The silence hung, an invisible and painful bond between two bedrooms 3,000 miles apart. Progeria, he said at last, it means you get old when you're still young. Old? Like how? Every way you can think of. Lose your hair, muscles shrink up, you get wrinkly and bony, and then you die of a heart attack or pneumonia or something else that kills old people. Most of us don't make it to 18. He tried to laugh. Most of us. Ha. Ah. There's only about two dozen people who have this in the whole world. I guess I should be proud. I don't know what to say. Isn't there medicine? 
There's not much you can say, Frederico, buddy. Madison? Yeah, like there's medicine for growing old. Meaning they can slow it down a little bit, which is the, the only reason I'm still alive. Hardly any progeria cases even used to reach their teens. Orlando swallowed. There it was, all exposed. Too late to take back. Well, now you know my dirty little secret. Do you look... Yeah, as bad as you'd imagine. Let's not talk about it anymore. His head was hurting worse than before. A throb like someone was squeezing it in a hot fist. He suddenly wanted to cry, but he wouldn't let himself, even, through the, even though the intervening... Normal-looking, no progeria sim would hide it from Fredericks. Let's, let's just drop it, okay? Orlando, I'm so sorry. Yeah, life's tough. I want to be a normal boy, and so do you, at least the online kind. I hope at least one of us gets a magic Christmas wish, Pinocchio. Don't. Talk like that, Orlando. You don't sound like yourself. Look, I'm tired, and I don't feel good. I gotta take my medicine now. You know when those little kids are meeting me. If you want to be there, be there. He broke the connection. Christabel waved her hand. The beam of light leaped up from the official Uncle Jingle's Jungle Crew clock, projecting the numbers on the ceiling. Christabel waved her hand in front of Uncle Jingle's eyes, hurrying before his recorded voice shouted out the time. She only wanted the quiet part of the clock right now. Zero, zero, 0013, the numbers read. Still a long time to go. Christabel sighed. It was like waiting for Christmas morning, except scarier. She waved her hand through the beam, and the numbers disappeared, leaving her bedroom dark again. She heard her mother's voice in the living room saying something about the car. Her father answered, deep and grumbly, so she couldn't understand any of the words. Christabel scrunched down and pulled the blanket up under her chin. Listening to her parents talking when she was in bed, usually made her feel safe and warm and cozy, but right now it only made her feel frightened. What if they didn't go to sleep, even when it was zero two zero zero? What would she do? Her father said something else she couldn't hear, and her mother replied. Christabel pulled the pillow over her head and tried to remember the words to Prince Pickapick's song in Otter Town. For a moment, she didn't know where she was. She had been having a dream that Uncle Jingle was chasing Prince Pickapick because the Otter Prince was supposed to be in school. Uncle Jingle had been smiling his big, crazy smile, getting closer and closer to Pickapick, and Christabel had been running toward him, trying to tell him that Prince Pickapick was an animal, so he didn't have to go to school. But no matter how fast she had run, she didn't get any closer. And Uncle Jingle's smile was so big and his teeth were so bright. It was very dark. Then it wasn't. There was a light flashing on and off. Christabel rolled over in bed. The light was coming from her storybook sunglasses where they lay on the carpet next to her dresser. She watches, watched the lenses blink, then go dark a couple of times. And then she remembered. She sat up in bed with her heart beating really fast. She had fallen asleep, the one thing she hadn't wanted to do. She swiped her hand over the clock and the numbers sprang onto the ceiling. Zero, two, four, three. Late. Christabel flung back her blankets and scrambled out of bed toward the storybook sunglasses. So you want to know what time it is? shouted Uncle Jingle. He was muffled by the blanket that had accidentally fallen in front of his mouth, but his voice still seemed like the loudest thing she had ever heard. 
Christabel squeaked and pulled the blanket away, then waved her hands in front of his eyes before he could yell out the time. She crouched in the darkness and listened, expecting any moment to hear her parents getting out of bed. Silence. She waited a little while longer just to make certain and crept across the floor to her blinking glasses. She put them on and saw the words, Christabel, I need you, sliding past over and over again. She turned the sunglasses on and off like Mr. Sellers had told her to do last time, but the words, Christabel, I need you, just kept going past. When she had put on the clothes and shoes she had hidden under the bed, she took her coat from the closet, moving it slowly so the hangers didn't rattle then opened the bedroom door and tiptoed out into the hallway. Her parents' door was a little bit open, so Christabel went past with the silentest tiptoe she could do. Her father was snoring. Just like Mr. Daddy Whiner. Mommy wasn't making any noise, but Christabel was pretty sure she could see her, a sleeping lump just on the other side of her father. It was funny how different the house looked at night with no lights on. It seemed bigger and much, much scarier, as though it turned into a whole other house after everyone went to bed. What if there were strangers who lived in her house, she suddenly wondered. A whole family, but they were, they were nighttime people who only came home after Christabel and her mother and father were in bed. That was an awful thought. Something made a noise, a kind of thump. So frightened she felt cold. Christabel held herself very still like a rabbit she had seen on a nature show when a hawk went by overhead. For a moment she even thought it might be the nighttime people, that a big man, an angry daddy, but not her daddy, might suddenly jump out of one of the dark corners yelling, Who's this bad little girl? But then she heard the noise again and realized it was just the wind bumping the weather blinds against the windows outside. She took a deep breath and hurried through the wide open living room. When she got to the kitchen where the light from the street lamp came in through the windows and made everything seem funny and stretched, she had to stop and think hard to remember the alarm number. Mommy had taught it to her so she could let herself in if there was an emergency. Christabel knew that letting herself out of the house at 0243 in the morning was not the kind of an emergency her mother had meant. In fact, it was just about the worst bad thing that Christabel could imagine doing. But she had promised Mr. Sellers, so she had to. But what if some bad men came while the alarm was off and got her parents and tied them up? It would be her fault. She pressed the numbers in order, then put her hand on the plate. The light above it changed from red to green. Christabel opened the door, then decided to turn the alarm back on again to keep the burglars out. She stepped outside into the cold wind. The street was empty in a way it never was in the daytime. The trees were waving their branches, like they were angry and almost none of the houses had any lights on. She stood, hesitating. It was scary, but in a way, it was wonderful, too. Wonderful and exciting and big, like the whole base was a toy meant only for her. She carefully buttoned her coat, then ran across the lawn, slipping a little on the wet grass. Christabel ran up her street as fast as she could because she was already late. Her shadow was giant-sized as she went out from under the street lamp. Then it got fainter and fainter until it reappeared again, just as gigantic but behind her when she reached the next light. She turned on Windicott, then on to Stillwell, her feet going slap, slap, slap on the pavement. A dog barked somewhere and she bounced down off the sidewalk and into the middle of the street, amazed that she could be there without having to watch out for cars. Everything was different at night. From Stillwell, she turned onto Redland. 
She was panting now, so she slowed down to a walk as she passed beneath Redland's old, tall trees. There were no lights that she could see at Mr. Sellers' house, and for a moment she wondered if she had done something wrong, if she had forgotten something he had told her. Then she remembered the storybook sunglasses spelling out her name over and over, and she was frightened. She started to run again. It was dark on Mr. Sellers' porch, and his plant seemed bigger and thicker and stranger than ever. She knocked, but no one answered. For a minute she wanted to run home, but the door opened, and Mr. Sellers' scratchy voice came from inside. Christabel, I was wondering if you'd be able to get away. Come in. Mr. Sellers was in his chair, but he had rolled it out of the living room into the hallway, and he was holding out a shaking hand. I cannot tell you how grateful I am. Come here, stand next to the heater for a moment. Oh, and put these on, will you? He produced a pair of thin, stretchy gloves and handed them to her. As she struggled to pull them on, he turned his chair back toward the living room. No sense in leaving fingerprints. I've cleaned up everything else already. Oh, but listen to me, Babble. Are you freezing, little Christabel? It's a cold night out. I fell asleep. I tried not to, but I did. That's all right. We have plenty of time before it starts to get light, and we only have a few things left to do. In the living room, sitting on a little plate, was a glass of milk and three cookies. Sitting on the little table was a glass of milk and three cookies on a plate. Mr. Sellers pointed to them, smiling his funny, crooked smile. Go ahead. You are going to need your strength. Well, then, he said as she nibbled the last bite of the last cookie, I think that's everything. Do you understand what you need to do? Really understand. Since her mouth was full, she only nodded. Now you must do it just the way I said. This is very dangerous, Christabel, and if you were hurt, I couldn't bear it. In fact, if there were any other way to do this, I would never have involved you at all. But I'm your friend, she said through the crumbs. Yes, and that's why. Friends don't take advantage of friendship. But this is really the most important thing, Christabel. If you could only understand how important it is. He trailed off. For a moment she thought he might be going to fall asleep, but his yellowish eyes popped open again. Ah, I'd almost forgotten. He rummaged in a pocket of his bathrobe. These are for you. She stared at them, not sure what to say. But I already have, but I already have storybook sunglasses. You know that, but not like these. You must take these home with you when we've finished, and then you must be sure to get rid of the other pair. Throw them somewhere where no one will ever find them. Otherwise, your parents will want to know why you have two pairs. These are different? They looked just the same, no matter how she turned them. She put them on, but they felt just like her other pair. You'll see later on. Tomorrow, in fact. Put them on after you get home from school. What time is that? Two o'clock? She nodded. Fourteen hundred hours is what my daddy says. Good. Now we need to get to work. But first, would you wash this glass and plate? Just a precaution. I know you have the gloves on, but we don't want to leave any other traces we don't need to. When she'd finished and had put the plate and glass back into the cupboard, Christabel found Mr. Sellers in the hallway. Sitting so still, with his funny head and small body, he looked like a doll. Ah, he said, time to go. I'll miss this place, you know. It's, it's a prison, but not an altogether uncongenial one. She didn't know what the long word meant, so she just stood. Come along. 
he said. It's in the backyard. Christabel had to push away some branches that the wind had knocked down before she could help Mr. Sellers down the ramp. There was just enough light from the street lamp to see by, but it was still very dark. The plants were growing everywhere, even in the middle of the lawn and out of the cracks in the pavement. Christabel thought it looked like nobody had come to do any work in the garden for a long time. The wind was still blowing hard, and the wet grass slapped at her ankles as she pushed him across the lawn. They stopped at the far edge. A rope hung over the grass there, both ends dangling from a funny metal thing on the limb of the big oak tree. It's here, he said, pointing at the ground. Just lift up the grass and push it back, like this. Now you take the other side. The grass at the edge of the lawn rolled up just like her mother rolled up the dining room carpet before she set the floor polisher to work. In the middle of the dirt that was now showing was an old metal plate with two holes in it. Mr. Sellers picked up a metal bar that was lying at the edge of the path and put it in one of the holes, then braced it against the handle of his wheelchair and pried up the plate, which fell over onto the lawn with a soft thump noise. Now, he said, first me, then the chair. You're about to learn the principle of the pulley, Christabel. I've used it to lower a lot of things already, but it will be much easier with you to help me. He heaved on the rope to lift his withered body from the chair, then looped part of it under his arms and, with Christabel's help, maneuvered himself over the hole. She kept him from bumping against the side as he slowly let the rope slide through his fingers. He only went down a little way before the rope stopped moving. See? It's not far. She leaned over the edge. A funny little square flashlight sat on the floor of the cement tunnel, splashing red light on everything. Mr. Sellers sat beside it on the floor, his legs curled under him. If she'd had an umbrella, she could have reached down and poked him. He loosened the rope around his chest and pulled it off without untying the knot. We'll hope that I'm the only person who knows about this, he said, smiling his melted-looking smile. These emergency tunnels haven't been used in 50 years. That's before even your mother and father were born. Now the chair he said, tossing the loop of rope up to Christabel. I'll tell you how to tie it. When she had attached the rope, Mr. Sellers pulled hard. The little metal thing in the tree squeaked, but at first the chair didn't move. Christabel pushed it, but that only made it move sideways. Mr. Sellers pulled again, this time rising up off the floor so that all his weight was hanging on the, on the rope. The tree branch bent, but the chair rose up just a little way off the ground. Christabel steered it over the hole, then Mr. Sellers let the rope slide back gently through his fingers. <coughs> but Mr. Sellers let the chair, the rope slide gently through his fingers, and the chair bumped to the bottom of the tunnel. Mr. Sellers pulled himself up into the chair, then attached both ends of the rope to the chair's handles. Step back, Christabel, he said. When she did, he waggled his fingers over the armrest and the chair started to roll forward. When the rope had pulled tight, the branch bent far down. Mr. Sellers waggled his fingers a little faster. The treads on the bottom of his chair seemed to grab at the tunnel floor and for the first time, the chair made a quiet noise like a cat purring. Something went snap. The branch sprang up, and the rope flew down into the tunnel. Ah, good. The pulley came with it. That was the only thing I was still worrying about. Mr. Sellers looked up to her, looked up at her. In the reddish light, he seemed like something in the Halloween spook house at the PX. I'll be fine from here, he said, smiling. He folded one of his arms in front of him and bowed his head to her like she was the Otter Queen. We who still labor, being weary, 
being weary of the world's empires, bow down to you. That's Yeats again. Now, don't forget to put on your new storybook sunglasses after school. And remember, be very careful with the car. He laughed. I'm finally going to get some use out of the thing. His face went serious again, and he lifted his finger. Be very, very careful. Do everything just the way I said. Can you remember the whole rhyme? Christabel nodded. She said it all for him. Good. Don't forget to wait until the street light goes out. Mr. Sellers shook his head. To think that it has come to this, that I should be forced to such ends. You're my partner in crime, Christabel. I've been planning this for a long time, but I couldn't do it without you. Some day, I hope, I can explain to you what an important thing you're doing. He lifted his crinkly hand. Be good. Be careful. Aren't you going to be scared down there? No, I may not be going very far, but I'll be free. And that's more than I've been able to say in a long time. Go on now, little Christabel. You have to get home soon anyway. She waved goodbye. Then, with Mr. Sellers helping from underneath, she dragged the metal plate back over the hole, then rolled the grass back over and patted it down. Here's the first thing you must think. The bar goes back beneath the sink. She took the pry bar with her into the house and put it under the sink, just like in the poem Mr. Sellers had taught her. She kept saying the rhyme over and over. There was so much to think about, and she was scared she'd get some of it wrong. That The bundle of stiff, smelly cloth was in the can under the sink, just like the old man had told her. She took it and the little plastic thing beside it, then walked out the other kitchen into the garage. There was just enough light coming in through the window at the top of the door to make out the car. Mr. Sellers' Cadillac sitting in the shadows like a huge animal. She very badly wanted to turn on the light, just as she had wanted to turn on the kitchen light. With Mr. Sellers gone, the house seemed darker and stranger than her own house had been. But the rhyme said not to, and leave off every single light. She made up her mind to be brave and thought of the next part. Now wave to open the big garage door. A switch by the kitchen will do that chore. When she passed her hand in front of the sensor by the entrance from the kitchen, the garage door slid upward on silent runners. <clears throat> beyond, beyond the shadowy bulk of the car, she could see all the way past the street lamp to the end of Beekman Court. Christabel walked around the car, reciting Mr. Sellers' rhyme. As she passed the passenger door, she saw something inside slouching in the driver's seat. It startled her so much she almost screamed, even though she could see right away it was just a big plastic bag. But even if it was only a bag, she didn't like it. She hurried around to the back of the Cadillac. Next, find the little secret door hidden behind the number four. The number four was on the car's license plate. She pulled at the edge and the whole license tipped down. Behind it was the place where you put something in the car. It was an old-time car, Mr. Sellers had once explained, and didn't work on electricity or steam. Even though he said the car had been in the garage when he moved to the house, Mr. Sellers always acted like it belonged to him, and he was proud of it. She unscrewed the cap, then unrolled the thick cloth and pushed one end into the hole and shoved it down. As she was doing this, the street lamp behind her suddenly went out. It got dark so fast that it seemed like all the lights in the world had gone out at the same time. Christabel held her breath. She could see the deep, deep blue sky and the stars through the open garage door, so it wasn't as scary as she'd thought at first. Besides, Mr. Sellers had told her it would happen. 
and anyway, she was nearly done with her special job. She stepped away from the cloth, held up the little plastic tube, and pushed the button. A spark jumped up. Even though she had been expecting it, it surprised her, and she dropped the plastic thing, which clattered on the garage floor, and bounced away somewhere to one side. There was nothing but shadow on the floor, deep and black. She couldn't see anything. Her heart went bump, bump in her chest like a bird was trapped inside her and trying to get out. What if she lost the plastic tube? Then Mr. Sellers would get in trouble. He'd said it was very, very important. And maybe she would get in trouble too, and her mommy and daddy would be so angry. Plus, maybe Mr. Sellers would be put in jail. Christabel got down on her hands and knees to search. Right away, she put her hands on something dry and crackly. She wanted to scream again, but even though she was really afraid of what might be down there, spiders, worms, snakes, more spiders, skeletons like in the spook house, she had to keep looking. She just had to. Mr. Sellers had said to do it when the street lamp went out. He had said... Christabel began to cry. At last, after a very long time, she felt the smooth plastic beneath her fingers. Sniffling, she got to her feet, then felt her way to the back of the car again. She held the thing away from her so it wouldn't be so scary, then pushed the button. The spark jumped and turned into fire. She took the end of the cloth, carefully, just like Mr. Sellers had said, and touched it to the fire. The cloth began to burn. Not a big fire, just a blue edge that smoked. She crammed her gloves into the opening to keep the license plate from swinging shut, then stretched the burning end of the cloth as far from the car as it would go before dropping it onto the floor. She walked out of the garage quickly, saying the last part of the rhyme to herself, partly to make sure she remembered, partly because she was really scared. Outside, she pushed the button on the wall and the garage door hissed down. Now, with almost everything done, Christabel turned and ran up Redland as fast as she could. All the houses were dark, but now all the street lamps were dark too, so she ran with only the light of the stars to show her the way. As she turned the corner and hurried down Stillwell, she threw the plastic flame maker into some bushes. Then... When she reached her own front lawn, all the street lamps suddenly started to shine again. She hurried to her front door. Christabel had forgotten about the alarm. When she pushed the door open, speakers all over the house began to buzz, startling her so much she almost wet her pants. Over the horrible noise, she heard her father begin to shout. Terrified, she ran as fast as she could and got, to, got through her bedroom door just before the door to her parents' room banged open. She threw off her coat and shoes and clothes, praying that they wouldn't come in. She had just got her jammies on when her mother hurried in. Christabel, are you okay? Don't be scared, it's the door alarm, but I think it went off by accident. It's some kind of power outage, I think. Her father shouted from down the hall. The wall screens are all off and my watch is almost an hour different than the kitchen clock. Must have triggered the alarm when it came back on. Christabel had just been tucked back in bed by her mother and was scrunching down beneath the covers, feeling her heart begin to slow when the flame at last reached the gas tank in Mr. Seller's Cadillac. It made a noise like God himself clapping his hands together, rattling windows for miles and waking up almost everyone on the base. Christabel screamed. Her mother came back into the bedroom and this time sat beside her in the dark, rubbing her neck and telling her it was all right. It was a gas line or something. It was a long way away. Christabel clung to her mother's stomach feeling like she was so full of secrets that she might blow up too. Lights flickered in the treetops outside as the fire trucks hurried past, going, Wee-ah! 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 And...
that's the end of that section. So that's where we're going to kick it for the night. And so, um, again, not a lot to report this week, but as always, a huge pleasure uh, to have you with me, all of you folks overseas and underseas and on this side of the seas and without seas, um, whatever the case may be, it's always nice to spend time with you. I will be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. to read the next section, which is, uh, I think, an Orlando section. Ooh, I forgot to put this in, didn't I? Um, and when I do, um, I will see you, or if I don't see you then, I will see you when I return next week at this same Tad time, same Tad channel. Have a lovely Easter Sunday, those of you who are celebrating, and um, I will talk to you very soon. And again, thank you for joining me. Take good care of your friends, family, loved ones, neighbors, anybody who looks like they're in need of a hand. It's a good time to help people. And I will see you very soon. Peace and good night. Or good morning.